All right, uh, I'm going to talk to you about endoscopy, bronchoscopy billing. I actually uh, have a position at Duke where I'm the chief medical officer of the patient revenue management organization. So Duke has a separate revenue organization that handles the billing for the entire health system. And I act as their medical, uh, so a chief medical officer, advise them on uh, various initiatives with billing with the physicians. So I'm going to expand on what Scott talked about but go into uh, more details on bronchoscopy billing. My disclosures, I guess I don't have anything related to this talk. I have other things, but those are displayed uh, on, the, on the website. But for this talk, I have nothing uh, to disclose. Again, I think I wanted to make sure that you know that billing practices vary per state, carrier, and ins institution. Always consult with your local folks uh, in your practice. Um, I think you all know this, but just to make sure we level set, CPT's current procedural terminology is the code, or the, they're the codes that we use for billing. Uh, this is actually uh, developed by the AMA. The purpose was to develop a uniform language uh, for us to communicate with the payers and uh, other agencies about what we're doing to our patients. And they're organized in various categories and numbers, but respiratory is in the 30,000, and that's why all our bronchoscopy codes are in, you know, they start with a three. And this is just a list of uh, you know, our CPT codes for bronchoscopy. I'm not going to go over, uh, over them, but I'm just going to highlight a few of them that you should know about if you don't do it today. Like, if you're doing an, a biopsy, a transplant lung biopsy, in an, a second lobe, you should bill for it. Um, and if you do a TBNA in two, three more lymph nodes, you should bill for it. So, and some of this will change for TBNA in January, and I'll talk about that. But make sure that if you do it in multiple separate lobes that you add these codes for the uh, billing. Um, those are the various uh, sort of interventional uh, codes from dilation to stent placement. Uh, again, if you put one stent and then another stent in a different bronchus, you have to uh, uh, bill for additional bronchial stent. Revision of stent is really adjusting the stent or removing it, and actually, surprisingly, pays better than placement of stent. So that's an interesting twist, I guess. Sometimes removing the stent is very easy, like silicone. Sometimes it's not. Um, and then any modality used from laser to electrocardi to APC to cryo, they are in one code, which is 31641. A lot of time, the you know, in your hospital, you put it and it pops up as laser because that's sort of the, the, the terms, but that doesn't mean if you use electrocardio or cryo, you can't use it. Uh, the code is in, inclusive of all the ablative modalities that we use. Uh, something uh, that is allowable, but you should also check with your local sort of uh, consultant or revenue manager is bronchoscopy with therapeutic aspiration. Uh, if you actually have a patient with um, mucus plugs that you aspirate. Uh, it has to be significant in mucus plugs, not just a little suctioning of uh, mucus here and there. Uh, if that's the main purpose, you can um, charge therapeutic aspiration initial and then subsequent in the hospital potentially second day if you do it again. Uh, some valve procedures, uh, codes. And then the navigation bronchoscopy, um, you can bill for bronch with computer-assisted image-guided navigation. Uh, the fiducial one here. This one actually is kind of controversial, and I actually would like to get the faculty input on this because I'm hearing some don't pay for it and some pay for it. So I'll keep that for the question, uh, that 7649 planning, 3D construction and mapping. Uh, I'm hearing different stories, so I'd like to get the, uh, the faculty's input on that. And then bronchial thermoplasty was added in 2013. If you did uh, if you do one lobe, usually the lower lobe uh, at a time, you do the 31660. If you do the upper lobes together, that's a little bit more money recognizing that you're doing two lobes. So this is the, uh, the sound of the breaking news, if you haven't heard yet, that uh, CMS updated the codes for EBUS, which I think is going to affect all of us. So we used to bill 31629 TBNA and 31620 EBUS as an add-on. That's going to change as of January. So now it's bundled. You cannot no longer do 31620. You have to bill 52 if you do EBUS TBNA, one or two lymph nodes. Uh, three or more, you do 31653. And if you do peripheral, so they recognize the separation between central EBUS and peripheral EBUS, so this is radial EBUS, basically. This is a new code. So it's going to be uh, 
these are going to be the codes as of January. So when you go back to your institution, talk to your manager about making sure that those codes will be utilized as of January. A good question for the faculty uh, when we have uh, time for question is, somebody asked it yesterday in the PG course, I'm sorry, in the review course, what if I do EBIS, but I don't end up sticking a, a lymph node? What do I charge in January? That's going to be an interesting question. Um, and uh, as Scott said, uh, you know, what we know is the public rates is the Medicare rates. We don't know what each institution negotiates, but we have access to public rates. And as I told you, they're different from state to state. So this is an example in 2012 from Georgia, Medicare reimbursement. And just giving you an idea, a little compare and contrasting. This is all professional fees. I'm talking only about professional fees. Uh, you know, a high-level H&P is about $195. A high-level follow-up is about $100. Critical care still pays more than, uh, you know, office H&P, um, about 271 for the, the first code. Uh, diagnostic bronc, as Scott mentioned, about 150 or so. TBNA, about 205. And you can see the numbers are a little different when Scott showed you, because this is Georgia. He might have used Pennsylvania. So there's variation uh, from state to state. Um, and just to, to show you a little contrast, IVC filter is 240, and a pacemaker is about 357. Uh, for stent, one stent you get 226, additional stent about $76. Revision of stent, as I told you, is more, um, recognizing that potentially there's more complexity, maybe with the metallic stents, but not usually silicone stents. Uh, tumor removal, excision, mechanical excision, and I'm gonna show you an example of the difference on how to build excision versus ablation. Uh, this is the, the laser, 261, same sort of amount of money. Uh, and then the EBUS is the add-on, the 70 bucks. Tracheostomy remains the highest reimbursed procedure if you do it uh, in your practice. It's about $400 for Medicare. Um, and this is just the, the sum of the bronc valve placement. I'll skip through that. Thermoplasty is the same range as you know, stent placement or other things that we do. Uh, so I'm going to expand a little bit on what Scott started talking about, the multiple endoscopy uh, coding rule. So um, you get 100% paid for the primary procedure. Everything else uh, is subtracted from this Medicare physician fee schedule. Uh, so there's a base, that's like the 31622, the, just the, the look-see. Um, and everything gets subs uh, subtracted from that. The add-on codes are paid 100%. Like the EBIS is currently an add-on code, so it does not get subtracted. So let me show you an example. So you saw a 65-year-old man with right upper lobe mass, and you do a bronchoscopy on him. So you did a transbronchial lung biopsy, 31628. That's 189. The brushing is 155 minus the base. You get $6. BAL, again, 150. Ordinarily, if you did it alone, just like Scott said, if you just did BAL, you would get that one uh, 50. But you here, you subtract it from the base, and you get 96 cents. And the EBUS is about 80, depending on the payer, 70 to 80. So this bronchoscopy is about $282. It makes sense. You might, you might think it's not fair, but you cannot get paid fully for each sampling separately because that assumes that you did the airway exam and you so performed the whole bronchoscopy. I want to point out some important modifiers um, because uh, in some practices, you don't worry about modifiers because there's an edit that catches it. When you sub submit you know, your bill or pay, somebody catches it. But I think you should know about them. And I'm going to focus on a few of them. 25, Scott mentioned it a little bit, uh, separate ENM with a procedure, meaning that if you see somebody in the same day, you did a consult, and then you did a bronchoscopy in the afternoon, if you don't put the modifier on the consult, the payer assumes that those were bundled, that you did the pre-procedure evaluation, not separate evaluation. It will toss it out and won't pay for it. Um, this is similar to decision for procedure. This is more common, commonly used in surgery, but they're similar. Um, and then 53 is discontinued procedure. This is an important one to know because if you start a procedure but you're not able to complete it, um, maybe you started putting the scope in, the patient is, you know, fighting you and you couldn't sedate him and you didn't really get past, you know, you got past the cords maybe. You can still build that, that procedure with that code, uh, with that modifier, excuse me, and that gets paid half usually by Medicare. 
Uh, and then for those 76, 76 and 77, those are the procedures that if you, you yourself repeat the same procedure, let's say somebody had hemoptysis in the morning, you did a bronchoscopy, and then you did another one at 9 p.m. because they had another bout of big, big hemoptysis. If you don't put that 76, the payer assumes that it's the same procedure and it was an error in billing, or you duplicate billing. Same as um, 76 for different MD, if you're your colleague, you're in the same practice, same tax idea. If you're in the ICU during the day and you did a bronchoscopy, your partner comes at 9 p.m., they do a bronchoscopy. If you don't put that modifier, again, it gets tossed up because you're on the same tax idea. And then 59, I'm gonna spend some time on at separate procedures because that's important to know and I have specific examples for you. So just an example about modifier 25, 65 year old man with hemoptysis and chest mass. You do a consult and a bronchoscopy. So you did the consult, but you did not put modifier 25 or your office didn't catch it. That got denied. And here's an example of your office not ordering the codes the correct way because 23 is brushing. They put uh, something that gets reimbursed less as the primary procedure, then BAL, then endobronchial biopsy. So that gave you $183. But if you did it right after you attended the symposium, um, 25, recognize that the consult is done differently. The biopsy is number one primary procedure. You got full payment, then you got the, the change for your BAL and brushing, and you got approximately $320, about $139 more. Modifier 59 is an important one to know, and again, your office might be doing this, but you need to understand it. So, indicates that you've done separate procedures in the same sitting. This is two scenarios in bronchoscopy that this happens. In diagnostic bronchoscopy, if you did transbronchial and endobronchial biopsy of the right upper lobe, they're bundled. Endobronchial biopsy is considered bundled with other, like transbronchial or TBNA. So it will not be paid. You can't bill it. So um, you, know, you put the transbronchial lung biopsy. If you use one of those software like Provation, you're trying to code, it warns you that this will not be paid because you cannot bill endobronchial biopsy because it's the same location. If you did it in different locations, so maybe there are two uh, masses this patient has or two lesions, so maybe you did the transbronchial lung biopsy in the right upper lobe and the endobronchial biopsy in the right middle lobe, here you put the modifier 59 indicating that you did these samplings in different locations and you gotta document that. In your bronchoscopy note, you should say the endobronchial biopsy was done in a different location than the transbronchial lung biopsy. So that would, make, that would make the payer pay you for this. For interventional pulmonologists who do therapeutic bronchoscopy, the same is true for laser ablation or ablation in general and tissue excision mechanical. So although you might spend two hours and you're you know, first using laser, electrocardiogram, and then you're going with rigid forceps and flexible forceps, the excision is bundled with the ablation. So that 31640 will not be paid. It will only be paid, again, if it's in a different location. Maybe the patient has two lesions, one in the trachea, one in the right main stem, and then you can say, okay, 31641 is laser, tissue excision is, you attach 59, you put your note that you did laser in the trachea, but you did excision alone in a different location in your documentation, and that would get this paid. So in summary, uh, for bronchoscopy billing, again, try to separate e &M from procedures by attaching those modifiers, or at least if your office does that, if they hold the charges, understand this process. And when you meet with them, I, I recommend that you meet with your office manager, revenue manager, at least quarterly, and understand these issues, understand if they're doing the right things. Again, they should be listing endoscopy orders in, uh, sorry, endoscopy codes in uh, order of importance, and they should, they do it, but you should uh, know all these rules to be able to converse with them. And I think uh, that's it, thank you. All right, let's open it for questions. Thanks, Bowman. Very nice talk. Um, interesting in uh, yours of the faculty's uh, perspective on uh, sort of the why things are billed or like, you know, so it doesn't quite make sense to me why 
um, you wouldn't get paid for ablation and excision. You know, there are different things. And then uh, the other thing about uh, bundling flexible and rigid uh, together is the same procedure and no difference. Uh, so I'm just uh, kind of curious about uh, the rationale behind that and uh, if this has been addressed by our societies. I'm going to let Scott talk about this because he's the expert in, in potentially lobbying for these issues. So historically, let me, let me um, answer the second question first. Historically, rigid and flexible were bundled together because it's either method. And in a revenue neutral system, if we were to say we want to separate out rigid, which is arguably harder than flexible, that would mean on a revenue neutral basis, we would get paid a little bit more for rigid and a little bit less for flexible with whatever the percentage distribution is. So the reason we've not pursued that is because it's a zero-sum game and we don't want to create incentives for people to do one thing or the other. We, we as a society have made the decision, we as a community have made the decision. We'd rather have a single fixed payment and you use whatever technology is appropriate for that patient with that clinical condition. And the reality is we do a lot more flexible diagnostic bronchoscopy than rigid. So if you increase the payment for rigid, financially you're potentially hurting yourself because you might do 100 rigid a year, 100 rigid a year, but you do 1,000 flexible a year. And then the, um, uh, the first question was really the, the logic and rationale behind the bundling. Bundling of laser and excision. So excision and destruction, those two codes, why you, yeah. why you get denied yeah. if so, you use it in the same area? Um, so the rationale there is if you're using the most um, comprehensive array of technologies, then what you'd be doing in the lower code would be already included so that there's no incentive to be doing things t twice, basically. It's really to prevent double or duplicate billing. Uh, much the same way, what you might do with a laser is going to be more intense and a lot more work than just a little APC, but you get the same payment for a group of things so that you have the clinical flexibility to do the right thing for the patient and we're not producing inappropriate incentives for one or another technology. If you use APC or laser just purely for hemostasis, can, is that something you can bill? Yes. So this 31641 doesn't differentiate why you're using it, whether for coagulation or ablation of tumor. If you use laser to, with the goal of ablating the, or coagulating the tumor, you can bill it. Thank you. I have a quick question in terms of the modifier you explained. Sometimes I see a patient in the office and then I ask them to do the PFD. Usually if the patient is really fragile and I know he's an old person, I don't want them to come back to office for the PFD. I ask them to do it. My office is staff tell, looking at me and say, okay, doctor, you're not going to be paid. Can we use that modifier for the PFD as well? I actually Same day? don't know the answer to that. Because PFD, is, are they treated like? No. Yeah, Kim? So, so the Medicare regulations say for XXX diagnostic tests, like pulmonary function tests, uh, there's no dash 25 modifier that is necessary. However, many private payers and commercial payers say, oh yes, we want that 25 modifier, modifier or we're not going to pay you because they, they have their own <laughs> reasons, right, which are basically to not pay. So I, I would encourage you in your particular uh, location, sounds like you need a 25 modifier on all of your PFTs if they're done the same day as an e &M. It's a very common question. A question about uh, multiple operator uh, procedures. Let's say someone's doing a flexible bronchoscopy and a second person either comes in for, for an EBIS or navigation. Is, is that a procedure that couldn't be billed separately? Or in the same 24 hours? Same 24 hours or a patient that has massive hemorrhage that caused by a transbronchial biopsy that requires balloon occlusion or APC done by a more skilled advanced physician, that wouldn't be allowed? If it's in the same 24 hours, you have to put the modifier. It's allowed. 
So it's allowed. Oh, oh so it, like it, a, a second operator in the same procedure? The second operator gets nothing. So the first operator is the person who initiates the test, and therefore that's the person who gets the total bill. So if you're the initiator of the test, you complete the bill. The second operator gets nothing. You can, however, do another procedure in the same day as a zero procedure day, but the billing you get is only uh, um, applicable as multiple endoscopy related to the prior procedure. So you could put those things on there, but it, but it gets bundled, not bundled, but it gets put into the multiple endoscopy rule related to the first procedure of the day. So can I say my information is that there's modifier 62. If you put that, that allows or, or indicates that two operators have done it, usually payers will pay 80% to the primary and 20 for the secondary, no? Close, there, there, there is a 62 modifier and for a procedure, that is on the 62 modifier list. Surgery. It's a surgical, it's usually a 90 day global, technically complex surgical procedure. The most common ones are skull based procedures and uh, head and face reconstruction, some uh, complex lower spine surgery, which requires an abdominal approach with a general surgeon and, and a neurosurgeon are common examples. Uh, the most common example that you're all familiar with is TAVR, where you have a cardiologist and a cardiac surgeon. And in that setting, with the 62 modifier on both claims, with the exact same diagnostic code on both claims, each of the two performing physicians receives exactly uh, half of 125% or 62.5% of the payment if it were billed by a single individual, hence the 62 modifier. Now, there may be some yeah, regional variations. I have to in say North this Carolina. is a contentious issue because I deal with it for our surgeons, and some payers agree, and some want to pay 80 20, some want to pay 60 60, and some don't want to do it again. So it's a very contentious issue if you do. And, you know, I guess endoscopy might be different than surgery, but for surgery, it's very contentious. It doesn't help you, no. no. One uh, more question. I think Joey had. Can you give him? Uh, he had a question. He's been having. Oh, sorry. OK, two more. Sorry. So um, sometimes I get referrals from patients two hours away. So I bring them to the endoscopy suite, see them as consultant, do the procedure the same afternoon. Yep. So would I get, you know, can I bill for the consult for the morning? Yes. That's why, where we need to use the modifier 25. That's the exact scenario. Um, I believe it doesn't matter where you see them, does it? It does? Sorry. Yes, repeat the question. If, you know, some of us do see patients from referral places and if we can see the patient in the pre-op area as a consult and then see and then do the procedure and build them with a modifier. Yes, as, as Moman said, it's not site specific. However, it need, the most important thing is it needs to be medically necessary. And remember, every bronchoscopy has a little pay, piece of the payment accounted for doing a quick H&P to make sure that the patient is still good for the procedure today. So if someone were to see you billing a consultation or some other E&M service, on the same day as every single bronchoscopy, I assure you warning bells and alarms will go off and somebody will be asking you to please explain this uh, to me. But if it's the occasional patient who gets called from, uh, you get a call from, they live two hours away, you can absolutely see them on the same day in the office or there in the Bronx suite, bill an appropriate medically necessary consultation or initial patient evaluation. 25 modifier and then perform the bronchoscopy. Meaning you can't game the system. You can't start bringing them to the Bronx suite and say, I'm going to do a new consult on each one of them. It has to be medically necessary. Yeah. And as, as an example, the uh, gastroenterology community is in arms over this, but they are specifically prohibited from any E&M service within three days before a screening colonoscopy because the Medicare position is that it's a screening study. You should be able to just have it done. So even if it's medically necessary, because they're in AFib and on warfarin, still no E&M. Last question. Just a quick question. Um, and first, about the copay earlier with PFTs. If you do it while you're doing it the same day, um, it's my understanding that you don't get to collect two copays for the same procedure. But uh, anyhow, uh, this is relevant to EBUS and doing multiple lymph node stations. So presently, um, when I bill for lymph node stations, they aggregate towards different lobes. So 
you do R4 and 7, that's billed as one, whereas if you do R11, you can uh, bill for the, the second billing code. How is the geographic map of the lymph nodes going to be related to the new 31652 code? Um, Kevin loves that area, so I'm going to let <laughs> Kevin, uh, this is his passion. Hi, well, a couple of things. One, uh, so now there are three new codes, or will be. One is for two or fewer, and we were very specific because the old version had low bar distribution, which made no lymph node sense. And so if you were potentially doing a right paratracheal and a right hyler, it was still the same station. So now it's, lymph, it's station, so it's by lymph node station. So that, that'll be the first change. The second thing is it's gonna be you know, two or fewer or three or more. So if you're doing a formal staging, there's a separate code. And the final thing I'd comment on, the, the 5-4 code, which is the old radial probe one, the, replacing the 31620, that one is still an add-on code to the basic Bronx where the others are freestanding. And it, it potentially get a little confusing because it's an add-on and you can still do transbronchial biopsy, TBNA, um, for peripheral, but if you did a TBNA during the EBIS, the first two codes with the two or fewer station or three or more, the, the 31629 is bundled in. And okay. it'll all come out in the new coding book. So, so I'm going to stop the questions. I apologize because we're running over time there. There's another symposium after us. But this has been a great discussion. And uh, we'll have some time at the end for more questions. So uh, 